A last star recovery on Friday helped the Sensex and the Nifty see a recovery in late trade. Of course, the FIIs have now returned back to the market in a big way. Hello and welcome to Editor's Roundtable. It's, we've gained for the third straight week with all indices ending in the green and ending higher. And lots to talk about. The auto segment has come back. Some really good earnings coming through this week. So we'll get cracking with our editors. Uh, folks, uh, how are we guys feeling about the market this week? Oh, absolutely good. Uh, Sonia, Sensex is within 1% of all-time high yeah. and uh, almost daily you see this pattern. The market has a gap up, then through the day does nothing. In fact, consolidates, declines and then at 3 p.m. there's a miraculous rally yeah. every day. And that's because, uh, you know, you're trusting the market to have a gap up next day once again. Rinse and repeat. And unless something major happens, look, I mean, uh, even after all the hawkish commentary from the Fed, 75 basis point and, the power, and Powell saying that, you know, we need to do more, we can over tighten and all. The market that day actually came back in the green. It just tells you the remarkable strength of the Indian market. I'm, I'm coining a term for this market, Teflon coated market. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, and by the way, that, I think the highlight of the week was the Fed decision. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the way it happened, right? I think so, Anuj, Anuj was up that uh, night. I was not. I mean, I've, I've, I used to stay up during the global financial crisis. I've stayed up many nights, but this time I, it was. I, Anuj, you know what? I think your bloodshot eyes today were worried about is because you were up that night. You should get your full night sleep. I, I, I normally don't. You know, remember I had, I, you know, told you that Kavita also, that poetry also, that about not waking up in the so night. Ah, exactly. So I normally don't. But you know, that night, just something, you know, something told me that, you know, just stay up. You know, something big is about to happen. And I'm telling you, just, you know, go and watch that on repeat on CNBC. And uh, I think. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. Every day you learn something new. Yeah. And that day I learned something new. I mean, you know, it didn't look like it was the most matured US market. I, you know, it looked like, you know, if you see the chart of that uh, yeah. Fed Funds futures, it was behaving like a mid-cap stock. It was behaving like a small-cap stock. Yeah. Hey, you know, this is a crazy market, Sonia. Absolutely. Yeah, go, go to YouTube. The timing, I was told. Somebody called me and told me, a market participants, please watch it 12 to 12.50. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely entertaining television. And, of course, the moves were, you know, really, really crazy all over the place. But you know, one thing that really stood out this week, Prashant, and I want you to take that forward, is how amidst everything, right, the market has been resilient, stood tall, held on to 18,100. Uh, as they say, the cleanest shirt in an otherwise dirty laundry basket. Oh, absolutely. Dirty neighborhood, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> right? But Teflon coated, really, because the market is just refusing to... You throw anything at the market and the market is uh, just kind of uh, rallying on. So let me just make a few points. The Nifty now is just 2.5% away from a new all-time high at a time when the Nasdaq is at year-to-date lows, almost at year-to-date lows. I mean, this is uh, quite incredible, which means that the Indian market has now once again regained the number one spot as far as year-to-date returns are uh, concerned. I mean, we just discussed, I mean, the Fed chair did a Jackson Hole once again. Uh, and, you know, e markets rallying is something which I guess the Fed does not like because markets rallying is financial conditions easing. Uh, and when it rallies too much, and if you sort of watch that press conference, there was a question thrown to the uh, to uh, the Fed Chair Powell, and the question was, you know, you make you made this decision, markets are rallying, and right on cue, he came in and smashed the market. After that, he said, well, you know, rates are going to be higher for longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so it's not a great setup if you are uh, outside of India, but in India, of course, as I said, there is that coating which helps us. Uh, the current market pricing for the U.S. also, uh, I mean, everything uh, sort of said and done is only another 75 basis points in terms of hikes. This is market pricing of what the Fed will do, which means that the bulk of the hikes are already behind. They're not ahead of us, which is important to note. Markets are forward-looking creatures. They're not backward-looking creatures. We've seen 500 basis points of rate cuts in the last, uh, what, 10 months or so. Uh, the question, though, is how long can rates remain higher? Will it be for much longer later into the second quarter, third quarter of next year? And I think that is something uh, which we will watch out for. Uh, but if markets are forward-looking creatures, you tie that in with flows. Dedicated emerging market flows have seen the highest weekly inflows. This is EPFR data in the past seven weeks. Uh, some three and a half billion dollars has come in. And of course, we've been seeing, we've been recipients of some of that as well. Uh, all of this means that the Indian market especially has a shot at all-time highs. As I said, just two and a half, four percent away. Uh, as of Friday, we have left exactly at, uh, you know, the recent swing highs, which is 18,179 or so, a little lower than that. Uh, and I think if uh, this level is taken out, uh, you've got a real shot. Two and a half percent is nothing. It can happen uh, despite all of the challenges which, is, which have been thrown our way. You want a range on the lower side. I think it uh, stands at about 17,900. On the upside, I think that uh, level is about 18,200 or so. So, uh, I mean, really a lot happening. 
at this point. Anuj, uh, the other point is ownership, right? Mm. Uh, this is, and you've highlighted FII versus local positioning and futures and options segment, uh, but you've got some interesting data on uh, ownership. Yeah. How, how much do local zone of the market <laughs> and how much do FII zone? Absolutely. <laughs> but before that, you know, since you referred to uh, Powell smashing the markets, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, I heard someone said that uh, did uh, Mr. Volker's soul came into, uh, you know, uh, 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 Mr. Powell? Because, you know, if you see, uh, Volker was the tallest uh, Fed chairman. Yeah. After that, consistently, the, the height of the Fed chair kept coming down, That's up until Janet Yellen. And, and, <laughs> then, you know, and, and the tone kept becoming dovish and dovish and dovish. All and of a sudden, kept comes, well. yes, the, rep, the rates kept falling. <laughs> kept the rates falling. actually have kept in pace with the height of height the Fed of chairman. <laughs> and it, it, it sort of bottomed out with Janet Yellen. Janet. And now comes uh, Mr. Powell. Who obviously is not as tall as Mr. Volker, but <laughs> you know the weights are back up. Anyway, that's uh, that's on the lighter note. Uh, uh, I mean, look, uh, we we become too you know fascinated talking about the market on a day-to-day -day basis and on a positioning basis. Uh, the real wealth is made in the long term, right? In the stock market. Uh, now, this is a very interesting tweet that that I came across. Uh, uh, and uh, this gave me the idea actually for, for today's uh, discussion. Uh, the FI versus DII equity inflows. Uh, this is cumulative uh, US dollar uh, uh, in terms of billions. Uh, now, CY11 to CY16, it's all FI. $66 billion FI inflow and DI is actually sold about $7 billion. Uh, then CY17 to 22 happened in which the FI, the DI has really took over and, and matched FI, 77 billion versus 22 billion. Actually, 41, uh, 20 to 22, it's actually $41 billion inflows uh, for DIIs and only $4.8 billion for uh, for the FIIs. I just thought that, you know, uh, let me see in terms of individual stocks, what has that meant? And uh, I didn't slice and dice the data just to suit this narrative. I just randomly took five or six stocks. Uh, I started with SBI. SBI's shareholding pattern in 2017 and the mutual fund ownership was uh, 10%. It's gone up to now 13%. FIs was 13%. It's come down to 10%. Look at ITC. The mutual fund holding was 5.6% uh, uh, at 2017 end, which has gone up to 9.6%. While DI, uh, the uh, FI holding has come down from 18.6% to 12.4%. Uh, look at ICICI Bank. The FI holding is down from 48% to all, just about 44%. And uh, the mutual fund holding is up from 22% to 28%. Infosys, uh, uh, the FI holding was 35%. It's come down to 31%. Look at the mutual fund holding. It's gone up from 10% to nearly 18%. And just look at Maruti. I mean, just uh, signifies the kind of buying that we've seen, especially in the domestic-facing stocks. The mutual fund holding has doubled from 5.5% to 10.5%, and the FI holding is down from 26% to 21.8%. Now, I didn't add the DI, the insurance data, because if you add that, then you will notice that uh, actually DIs now, in some cases, own more than FIIs. Slowly, steadily, but surely, we are taking back some of the ownership uh, from the FIIs. The only thing is that the FIIs managed to get in really cheap uh, when, you know, the liberalization happened. And so, yeah. you know, they, they can sell a lot, but still be sitting on a large, a large amount of money. You know, Rhythm yeah. was here when the last time yeah. he was on. Uh, yeah. That's very interesting data, Anuj, by the way. He basically made this point that FII, I mean, you said, I think the last the last bar was three years, right? Last three yeah. years, yeah. $41 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Rhythm made the point since 2014, FII inflows is reduced, but FDI inflows has gone up, mm. has gone up substantially. Mm. Uh, and this, this was very different uh, the yeah. 10 years prior. So, uh, interesting data. But I think Nimesh is going to tell us that FI is going to come back. You know, gonna, that, that's the more. feedback. You know, that's the feedback, uh, Prashant, that uh, there is a lot of global capital which is almost looking to reallocate into India. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the, you know, uh, headlines in, in global newspapers, I was talking to some large, uh, you know, sell-side uh, sales heads who have been to US and Europe for road trips. And the overall feedback is there is a lot of money on the sidelines to come back to India. People are moving out of China. People are moving out of Europe and looking to invest into India. So India in that way is a, is a shining market, so to speak, for the global investors as well. So, And that's clearly showed up in this week as well, like the FIs of 10 net buyers, and looks like we are poised for a breakout. You know, you, you, talk, you spoke about 18,150 or 18,170 as a level to watch. I think above 18,300, you'll see a big breakout on the Nifty, and, and that will be held by the Bank Nifty as well. So while, uh, you know, for this week, if you see the Nifty uh, has been range bound just 1.5% up, but in the context, it speaks for itself that, you know, even with the so, such a uh, hawkish tone, uh, global markets not supportive. We are we are actually up one and a half percent. But look at the broader markets. That's where the big action was this week. Uh, Nifty is not giving you a right picture. Uh, as I as I've been saying, you know, earnings are are g giving a lot of reactions to individual stocks. So if you look at positive uh, reactions to earnings, today Amara Raja was up ten percent. We saw Dalmia Bharat up to ten uh, percent in two days. You know, cement stock just small bit, and and you saw a big reaction to that. M&M Finance was a big reaction. On the other side. 
Look at Bandhan Bank, you know, just weak numbers and, and, the, and the stock shaved off 10%, uh, likes of LIC housing. Voltas was down 5-7% this week on bad numbers. So there was a lot of reactions to individual names uh, in, the, in this week because of the earnings. The big, the big number that I've picked up, I was talking to some large investment bankers, and the feedback is just watch out for a large inflow, both FDI and FI put together. The number I'm told is close to $50 billion. You know, th wow. that's, that's a big number to watch out for. So it will be not only FI money, but it will be FDI money as well. But that can have a big impact on the Indian markets. And that's why I feel you know, markets are poised for a breakout uh, in, the, in the very near term. Also, if you look at the, the primary market activity is picked up. There are seven IPOs lined up in the month of November. Also, you know, both you have been highlighting uh, there, are log there are 10 stocks where their lockups will open in the month of November. So a lot of liquidity event to watch out for. But I guess the big takeover for me was there is a lot of global capital looking to come into India and, and could be f 25 to $50 billion of FDI and FIR money waiting on the sidelines to come into India in the next well, one month. So which, which stocks these, this money will go into also, but it's not telling us. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's something we should avoid. You know, that's I think, what, on the, I think what stood out for me is yeah. that these sales heads are going to Europe and US for people road have, trips. People have start, no, <laughs> I want to go for these road trips. trips that, <laughs> there are, these are all marketing tips. People are going out for, for blogs, for deals. So there is a lot of action, Sonia, in the... In the market, you know, there's so much of appetite from. Uh, By the way, I got a sneak peek into that list. Huh? There's, there's, a, list. <laughs> <laughs> there's a large big investor who's invested in uh, the company which runs the seaplanes in Maldives. Uh. And oh, they do all their meetings there. So, yeah. you know, if you want to feel a bit more jealous. And let's, so. one, day we'll get one day we'll get invited for those, uh, for those meetings in Maldives, right? But I have a big story that I'm tracking, which was in the auto sector this week. And it was a return of growth in the domestic two-wheeler manufacturer. So, I'm just going to take you through some data. And this is very interesting because, as we know, the two-wheeler space has been in a slump for a very long time. But now, the data indicates that the last three months, there's been a significant return of growth in this space. So, the three manufacturers that I'm looking at, one is Bajaj Auto, there's TVS Motor as well as Aisha Motors. Let's start with Bajaj Auto. Uh, from an average of around 1 to about 1.8 lakh units, all the way to a 2 to 2.5 lakh units. This is just the domestic sales that I'm talking about. And Bajaj Auto is not alone. It has both TVS as well as Aisha for company. Just look at TVS Motor. It's been by far the strongest stock in the auto basket. And from an average, once again, it was languishing in about 1.8, 1.9 lakh units all the way to about 2.75 lakh units. The best of the lot by far has been Aisha Motors. We've seen the Royal Enfield sales. We've seen the Hunter sales have been phenomenal. Uh, here's the monthly trend. Just look at that. It's a big bump up that we're seeing. So that's the big theme that I'm talking about, the return of the domestic two-wheeler manufacturers. Now, a lot of brokerages this week raised their earnings estimates and their target prices on the stock. They've there were two upgrades that came in on Bajaj Auto, Morgan Stanley, as well as... Um, uh, Golden Sachs, there's an upgrade to an overweight. Now, the reasons cited are that the worst of the export pressure is now behind us in terms of two-wheelers. And there's a very strong portfolio of brands. And premiumization is the big focus area. So, Pulsar, KTM, the new Triumph that will launch in 2023. Um, in fact, CLSA also raised their volume assumptions 4 to 8 percent over FI 23 to 24 uh, due to a strong festive season. So, a lot of brokerage upgrades coming in over there. Apart from that, uh, Hero Motor Corp is the only one that's been lagging. But in their conference call, they also mentioned that there's a clear trend towards premiumization. They are building a strong pipeline of premium products. And um, then comes Coming to Royal Enfield, where the new Hunter has seen exceptional response, uh, as well as you know some brokerages going ahead and raising their estimates for Aisha Motor. So this is the big theme that we're talking about: a revival of the domestic two-wheeler space. And uh, Nigel, I know you're itching to come in on this. I'm going to toss it back to you. Uh, the new Meteor. There are spy shots that have come out of the new Meteor. Of course, the Hunter has done exceptionally well, and domestic two-wheelers are back. So which one are you buying next? Uh, you know, Sonia, when you have an interceptor, you can't look at the Hunter. Right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's going to be too lightweight, I think. <laughs> okay, Prashant, what about you? Uh, the the, the one, one aspect, this is not exactly two wheelers, but four wheelers, especially, right? Maybe two wheelers as well. The fact is, you know, interest rates are going up, and uh, somebody I was speaking to was said that usually it does hurt, but it's not hurting now. I don't know, you can weigh in, Sonia. Is because there, for the last two years, I mean, first of all, the, people could not buy, mm. uh, there were lockdowns, etc. And, and now there, were no, there was no delivery, I mean, yeah. especially yeah. in the car segment. Yeah. So while rates are going up and they've gone up quite a bit, I mean, this may continue and the run may continue, these, these macro things may not hurt too much at the margin.
Correct, correct. In fact, you know, the entire rate piece has to be looked into because it's going to have an impact going forward, whether it's real estate, whether it's autos, even for NBFs, you know, I was reading a report from Goldman Sachs yesterday and they said with, with uh, they are expecting 100 basis point hit, uh, you know, f uh, incremental cost of funds to go up and that would mean 10% hit on earnings. So there is going to be that challenge going forward of, of rising mm. interest rates. And I guess that's the best time to look at banks as well. You know, banks has been the big outperformer. And Numbers have been banks, quite right? strong and Nigel has put out a good piece. So Nigel, take it forward. Well, uh, you know, it seems that the PSU banks, they believe that their time is here. And in 2022 so far, everyone's talking about a resilient market, right? The Nifty is more or less resilient holding with gains of around a percent to around 2% or thereabouts. We just take a look at the Nifty PSU Banking Index. That's in a world of its own. And it's been a big outperformance that we've seen coming in from there. And there are valid reasons, right? At the start of this fiscal, we had data that came out that said that the gross NPS, as well, they had declined. The capital adequacy ratio as well, uh, you know, indicated that these banks are well capitalized. Keep in mind, in the last couple of years, they have raised close around 1.5 lakh crore, and they're well capitalized for the next few years. Well, that's good news for the government. That's good news for shareholders as well, because now these banks are poised for growth. And they have backed that up, because, you know, if you look at the past quarter's numbers, well, they have been uh, giving you one story. That is, loan growth is on the rise, which is pretty good news. The other factor is, it looks like they're gaining some market share. And this has come with employee costs being more or less flattish. So the operating profit as well has been improving. Let's run you through. A few banking names have joined us, and the commentary has been very positive. Karur Vaishya Bank, well, remember, the net NPS is around 5%. It's come to around 1.4%. The management says it'll come down even from here. Canada Bank, they said that they're going to grow well in the next couple of years. The NIMS are going to be maintained. And they're saying the gross NPS, well, it could even come sub that 6% odd mark. So that as well is quite encouraging. PNB, they went ahead and they upped their uh, loan growth guidance. And also the management said here on CNBC TV 18 that FY24 is going to be a golden year. Let's see whether or not that happens. And finally, Bank of India, they as well followed suit. They revised their growth guidance for the year. And they've also said that things will improve, particularly on the corporate book side, which is pretty encouraging. But why is the banking space a consensus buy? Well, initially, as rate goes high, well, it's positive for banking names. And the PSU banks, their liability franchise is pretty strong. So that's, uh, that holds them in good stead. The loan growth is picking up. The worst of asset quality is likely to uh, be behind them. And also these banks, as I said earlier, they're well capitalized. So with corporate India delivered, well, it seems that if CapEx is going to pick up, well, these uh, banking names as well could gain. Finally, what stands out for the PSU banking names is they are still trading at sub one price to book. And the street believes that this is still attractive because they are larger peers. That's the uh, private banks. Well, they are trading at around two and a half to around three times odd. So the valuation argument is in their favor. Let's see whether or not now, this time around, they're flattering as of now, but will they deceive? For the time being, the street believes that they are in for a good run, which explains their outperformance. Back to you guys. Okay, Nigel, thanks for that. It was indeed the big theme, right? Yuko Bank telling us that after many, many years, corporate uh, profitability has gone up and corporate stress has gone down. That's the big takeaway. So what we'll do is we'll take a quick break. On the other side of the break, Saurabh Mukherjee will be our guest and we'll pose all of these questions to him. Be back in a bit. Welcome back. You're with us on Editor's Roundtable. And joining us now to discuss the market further is Saurabh Mukherjee, founder of Masterless Investment Managers. Uh, Saurabh, good evening. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I believe you had a trip to the U.S. Uh, tell us, uh, what's the feedback? Because, uh, you know, the markets in the U.S. have been quite volatile. And uh, uh, the Fed's clearly been indicating that uh, they're still some distance away from that pivot. Uh, what, what was your feedback? Hey, look, I know that the Fed for the discussions on my trip focused on China because uh, mm -hmm. without any prompting on our, any, any prompting on our part, the, the institutional investors that we met, the pension funds and endowments that we met, uh, articulated their alarm at the situation in China, and specifically wild fever over there, wild fever in America, this new Politburo, the, the new Politburo under Xi Jinping got created, and we must have read in the press that you know, the Politburo's composition is alarmed uh, everybody uh, across the world. So what we heard there's from a the bit of an issue with uh, I think there's a bit of an issue with your audio, so we're just going to try and fix that. But you know, one thing I thought we had done away with was the word pivot. Mm. I've, I've, we've used that word so much. Finally, I heard you use it again. I thought we've put that away for a while. There are a lot of memes on the word pivot actually this uh, this weekend. <laughs> you know, all I needed was pivot. So from being 
Yeah. The pivot was what from hawkish to dovish, right? <laughs> the pivot, the pivot it is from hawkish to more hawkish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you guys heard the news of uh, sort of moving away while they fixed the issue with the sort of Baiju's uh, getting on uh, Messi. Yeah. Messi. I, Absolutely. Uh, we should ask Saurabh that. <laughs> but yeah. I think we have Saurabh back. Saurabh, go on. Uh, so, uh, sorry, yeah, go on. Your feedback from the US investors you met. The, the level of alarm is quite high and from what I could make out uh, from these investors, they're stopping investments in China. They're stopping incremental flows to China. Um, in fact, some of them have publicly said that they are stopping incremental investments in the Chinese stock market. And that sort of, to my mind, leaves them with only one relevant place to invest. Uh, outside uh, the developed world, and that one destination is India. So uh, unless unless we score an own goal in India, we as in the country scores an own goal, I think flows into India from the from America will pick up in the foreseeable future, given that flows to China have basically come to a grinding order. If you look at the data of flows into China, it's close to zero, and there's three and a half billion dollars of, of Western money invested in the Chinese stock market. I reckon some portion of that uh, moves to moves to India. Even if a fifth of that moves to India over the next three years, you're basically looking at a virtual doubling of FII investments in the Indian stock market. Okay. And this morning, actually, Tiger Global was yeah, another Tiger one which came out. And, uh, you came know, out. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Saurabh, uh, thanks for joining us on the show. In fact, that was the point that you know Nimish was making a while back as mm -hmm. well as to how we're perhaps headed for a big breakout on the upside. For investors who are watching you right now and maybe looking to prepare for that upside, how do you approach this market? What are uh, the themes that you're looking at? Because it's been a fairly decent earning season as well. Right. So I think, look, I mean, if you, if you step, sit back and step back and look at what's happened in our country over the last decade or so, it's been a giant formalization story. Right? We, we, till a decade back, we were, we were a country with heavy levels of black money, heavy levels of informal activity, weak tax collections. A whole bunch of reforms have been expedited in the last 10 years. The result of which is tax collections are growing twice as fast as GDP growth. I never thought I would see that in my career. But tax collections are going twice as fast as GDP growth. The flip side of that is enormous pressure on the informal sector, enormous pressure on low-income earners in the country. But the benefit is listed companies are gaining market share from the informal sector hand over fist, and that's resulting in them announcing capex. We seen that we saw that in FI22. We saw that in this set of results, big capex announcements coming through because the listed world can see that the country is there for the taking. And I think that becomes the theme for the next few years. We continue formalizing this economy, connectivity improves, GST becomes, the GST numbers pick up. And as we formalize this country, cost of capital falls, financialization increase, and the FII is going to join that party. As the FII has joined that party, cost of capital further falls, and you, and you see the economic uplift, the economic recovery coincide with the FII arrival. Hi, Saurav. Uh, you know, talking about earnings and uh, the shift from unorganized to uh, organized, uh, you know, one of those themes with the footwear space, and you have been quite vocal about Relaxo. Now, they disappointed in the past quarter, but the story still looks strong, according to you? So, I think we were quite uh, happy with what they have done. We've been very strong proponents to them and to all our investing companies that, look, this is the time to go for the jugular folks. We keep telling our investing companies, when input costs rise, when input costs rise, if you are able to cut prices, and if you don't push through price hikes when input costs are rising, you by definition will kill the informal sector. So our plea, our request to all our investing companies is use this context, use this time of rising input costs, don't hike your prices, take a margin hit and kill the competition because this is the best kind I, I have seen in, in India of going after the informal sector. In footwear, I would say 70-80% of the sector is informal and therefore we are delighted with what the relaxer management has done, is doing to kill the competition, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters of operating margin hits, we don't have a problem with, provided they gain market share aggressively and they basically clean out the, 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 the informal end of the, of the footwear sector. All right, Saurabh, uh, we'll have to leave it at that. Bit of a scratchy line there, but we got your gist. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. And with that, it's a wrap. But guess what? Next week, we're coming back and Again, there's got another holiday. 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 <laughs> Who's excited? Come Final on. Final truncated week of this year. <laughs> Final truncated week of this year. And what are the big weekend plans?
Um, I'll be watching Brahmastra, which is releasing on OTT. So okay. I missed None it. None of you is watching after all that discussion. The Fed. Uh... <laughs> I watched it live. I don't want to put myself there's to lot, that. There's lot okay. better things to do over the weekend. I'm sure. <laughs> and there's a lot of sporting action, by the way. The T20 Absolutely. World Cup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a nice, great tennis tournament going on in Paris. I think so. the finals are today, right? Uh, uh, the, the tennis one? The no, no, today is the semi finals, uh, but uh, finals, quarters, so, uh, semis, and Sunday is the final, yeah. Okay, so lots of, uh, lots of things to do over the weekend, but we'll be back bright and early on Monday morning. Until then, stay safe.